If I tell you uniform linear motion and this happens in your head, explosions! You should really watch the first part of this video, link in the description. We have seen time, position, displacement, distance, three types of speed, but it's time for the final boss, acceleration. Acceleration comes into play if speed starts to change, but hey, there is not a single speed, there's also velocity, and therefore there is not a single acceleration. This time you're lucky, you only have two accelerations. Average acceleration, which is calculated as delta v over delta t. Remember that delta stands for difference. This stuff means that the average acceleration between time tf and time ti is the final velocity at time tf minus the initial velocity at time ti. If my grandpa is going from a velocity of 20 meters per second to 28 meters per second in 4 seconds, his average acceleration is 28 minus 20 over 4, so 2 meters per second squared. Needless to say, average acceleration is a vector. The second acceleration is the instantaneous acceleration, the ugly version of instantaneous velocity. This is not delta v over delta anything, it's the acceleration at a precise moment in time, which indicates how rapidly grandpa's velocity is increasing or decreasing at a given instant. We could say it tells you how much grandpa is holding down the accelerator at a specific moment. The instantaneous acceleration is also a vector, but we'll talk more about it later. Note that in physics we talk about acceleration both when you go faster and when you slow down. Some rebels occasionally talk about deceleration, but often people will talk about acceleration even when velocity is decreasing. Matteo, but how can I tell if I'm actually accelerating or slowing down if it's always called acceleration? The trick is to look at the sign of acceleration. If grandpa is moving following the frame of reference and his velocity is going up, acceleration is positive. If he is slowing down, acceleration is negative. Signs are swapped if grandpa is coming back home and therefore he's moving against the frame of reference. Now acceleration is positive if speed decreases, negative if it increases. Let's say it straight away. Either you are training for a competitive physics test or in your life you will see almost only constant acceleration motions. So, speed changes, but it always changes at the same rate. Acceleration in these cases always has the same value, which is why this stuff is called uniformly accelerated motion. And now you do not have one, but two loads of motion. The first one is about position. Final position equals initial position plus initial velocity times time, plus one half acceleration times t squared. If you don't know what si is, you know what to do. Watch out for vi, this is the initial velocity, therefore the velocity you start with. If you start still, vi is zero. Second law of motion, velocity at time t is equal to the initial velocity plus a times t. Be double careful here, vf is the velocity at the final time tf, so it's the velocity at position sf. These two equations are always used together. Enlightening example. Grandpa is hunting mushrooms in the woods, when suddenly he sees a porcino in the distance. Grandpa sprints with an acceleration of 2 meters per second squared and catches the porcino in 4 seconds. Let's try to calculate how far Grandpa had to run to catch the mushroom and how fast he is when he reaches it. Let's set a frame of reference. Grandpa starts from position 0, so SI is 0. He wasn't moving at the beginning, so vi is also zero. Acceleration is 2 meters per second squared, and time is 4 seconds, so grandpa finishes 16 meters away from where he started. Looking at velocity, vi is zero, a is 2, t is 4, so grandpa catches the porcino with a speed of 8 meters per second. Tonight, polenta with mushrooms. <laughs>
Matteo, but I know that there's a third secret formula. When can I use it? The secret formula is delta S equals VF squared minus VI squared over 2A. This formula is great when you don't want or you can't use time. You can use it in place of one of the laws of motion of your choice. In most cases, two of these three equations are more than enough to solve in problems. You can choose which one to use based on your data. When you drop your phone or throw something in the air, you are dealing with an accelerated motion. It is accelerated because speed changes. Your phone starts still in your hand and gets on the floor at the speed of a jumbo jet, while the bottle cap is fast at the beginning but it slows down as it goes up. Vertical motion of objects is an accelerated motion. The cool thing is that you don't have to come up with the acceleration value, because it's always the same number. It's g, 9.81 meters per second squared. Wait a second, is this the same g I used to calculate the gravity force? I studied forces, I got a C plus on that test. Yeah, it's the same g, aka gravity acceleration. You have to brand this number on your neurons because it's gonna show up a lot in physics. Remember, 9.81. When dealing with vertical motion, you should place the frame of reference on the ground and direct it upwards. So acceleration is actually negative, negative 9.81. VI is positive if the body is thrown upwards and negative if it is thrown downwards. I made a promise and so here it is. Grandpa eating polenta with mushrooms. <laughs> First of all, get delta S, delta T, delta V, all the delta out of your mind. These guys are used just for average quantities. Instantaneous quantities are instead what you usually find in laws of motion, but there are a couple of other ways to get them. The first method is only for more experienced students. Instantaneous velocity is the derivative with respect to time of the position law of motion. Instantaneous acceleration is the derivative of velocity law of motion. If you are not so masochistic, don't worry, here is a second method. You must get a graph, which can be a position time graph or a velocity time graph. Let's take a position time graph like this one, which describes grandpa's motion as he's chasing a shroom in the woods. If we want to know his instantaneous velocity at time, let's say 10 seconds, we have to put ourselves on that point on the graph and draw the tangent line like this. Tangent means it only touches the graph in that point. The slope of this line is the value of the instantaneous velocity at that moment. The more inclined the line, the faster grandpa was running. Same story goes for speed time graphs, but for instant acceleration this time. In a graph like this one, let's say we want to know instantaneous acceleration at time 8 seconds. We put ourselves at that point on the graph and draw the tangent line. The slope of this line is the instantaneous acceleration. Matteo, I still don't have superpowers and I can't calculate slope just by watching a graph. What's the point of this method? You don't have to calculate anything. This is just to give you an idea of what kind of motion you are dealing with and what acceleration and velocity could be, but you don't have to come up with numbers out of nothing. Only in very specific situations you can get some actual data out of motion graph. If you haven't subscribed yet and haven't told all your classmates and friends about this channel, this is the right time to do it. Remember that you can support me with a single or a monthly tip. Leave a comment if you have any suggestion. See you next time. Ciao!